Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, <laughs> notoriously, the after lunch session is the graveyard slot. So when I see you with your eyes closed in deep contemplation, I shall understand. <laughs> This afternoon's um, friend to introduce to you is possibly the least well-known of the three, Madeleine Delbrel. Um, and I think from the two sessions we've had so far, you could probably guess the shape of her life, because <laughs> it's uncannily similar to that of Mother Maria and Dorothy Day. As the name indicates, Madeleine Delbrel was a French woman born in 1904 and died rather prematurely in 1960. She grew up in an articulate, artistic, irreligious family. She, as a teenager, declared that she was a committed atheist and then fell in love with somebody who uh, unfortunately decided to convert to Catholicism and become a Dominican friar. <laughs> At which point she had a bit of thinking to do and at the age of 20, her thinking, and rather more than just her thinking, led her to say yes to God. She tried her calling as a Carmelite nun, but she was no more constitutionally fitted for nunship than Mother Maria was, and emerged fairly rapidly from that. She, was, she continued to be a very, very independent spirit. She designed her own clothes, and the photographs show you what the results were like. <laughs> Um, she was sparky, warm, funny, and rather unconventional. And she decided that her calling was, as my subtitle indicates, with les gens de la rue, the people in the street. And it's, you know, it's the French equivalent of the man or woman in the street. And one of her best-known books, a collection of talks and papers that she gave, is simply called... We, the people in the street. Nous, les gens de la rue. So her theme is consistently, what is holiness like for people who are not specialists? Her own life, after her conversion, rather illustrates the point. She, like Dorothy Day, set herself to offer a ministry of hospitality in the city for people who were, in various ways, marginal or in trouble. And eventually, she found herself in a town called Ivry, I-V-R-Y, Ivry-sur-Seine, not very far from Paris. And that's where she spent most of the rest of her life. She trained as a social worker and ended up being what we'd call in Britain Director of Social Services for this town, Ivry, <clears throat> which was un unsurprisingly dominated by um, the far left, so that she was dealing just as much as our other heroes with communist politicians and all sorts of urgent issues around the welfare of the poor. So the rest of her relatively short life, dying as she did in her 50s, the rest of her relatively short life was spent basically as a worker and an advocate for the poor in this town, but also in a much more hidden way as somebody who was writing and disseminating some really extraordinary riches of spiritual insight. And it's really only after her death that some of these materials began to be drawn together. As I say, there's the collection of her papers and writings called The People of the Streets, and also a book translated into English under the title of The Little Monk. Now, <clears throat> it's a really wonderful collection of aphorisms about not just the Christian life in general, but the life of Christian leaders in particular. But I have a great complaint about it. It is ruined by a series of cute little cartoons showing jolly little monks. And actually, it's, it's so massively not the point of this collection <laughs> that I feel it wrecks the book. If you come across this volume, The Little Monk, Madeleine Delbrel, just shut your eyes to the stupid cartoons and concentrate on the, the real stuff of it. So what's she writing about here? As I say, it's not simply discipleship in general. It's Christian leadership in particular. 
because although she never held any position in an ecclesiastical hierarchy, she was very conscious of some of the issues that are involved in trying to provide Christian leadership as a layperson in her professional setting. And the fact that this has really quite a lot to say to the ordained as well, perhaps in itself, tells us something. But let me just share with you one or two of her aphorisms about leadership. I, I could actually spend the next half hour simply reading this aloud to you, and that would be much more useful, really. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> this is on leadership. Beware of how you judge those who do not appreciate you. Beware of how you judge those who do not appreciate you. Seek out the company of those who don't like you, and you'll get a chance to be fair. Put yourself in the shoes of others. Don't force them to wear yours. If you have a bad memory, don't forget to use pen and paper. <laughs> and um, in brackets, on a day of great eloquence, to shine is not the same thing as to enlighten. You can see why she's uh, <clears throat> worth reading and why possibly I, I kept this book by my side um, daily in a former job. <clears throat> <clears throat> Recognize that it is very fortunate for a monastery to have an incompetent leader when upon confessing his incompetence he leaves it to God. <laughs> a comforting saying. <clears throat> But all of that is part of the way in which she outlines in this book a kind of Christian realism which goes to a very, very deep level indeed. A Christian realism which constantly seeks to get away from, well, from drama, really. What she's writing about again and again in these aphorisms is how to stop ourselves becoming melodramatic about our discipleship. How to recognize both posturing and anxiety. The posturing that seeks to be more than we ever can be, the anxiety that seeks to be less than we really are. So that we actually, in the words of the great Shaker hymn, come down where we ought to be, with our feet firmly on the ground. Recognizing that we can't please everyone. Recognizing that our failures can become an occasion of grace, not only to ourselves, but to people around us. Which I find quite a challenge, but I suppose when you think about it, it ought to be true. Not least because when we fail, when we make our mistakes, as we inevitably will, then that helps other people not to think too highly of us, which is as important as our not thinking too highly of ourselves. At the same time, she is very clear that our duty to ourselves and our neighbour is active, hopeful honesty. And part of the force of this collection is, I suppose, the questions it leaves about how we stay honest in leadership and ministry. When certain people question your character, don't respond by doubting theirs. Your children didn't come to the monastery to engage in your personal drama. Your attitude reflects the beat of your heart. Love and your face will be like a fresh, wrinkle-free apron. <laughs> Let God take over. Then you take action, if there's still anything to do. <laughs> Some of these aphorisms are also about prayer and silence. Rather than trying to keep quiet, listen. Rather than trying to keep quiet, listen. Hold your tongue when you can, so that you can speak when you must. And particularly on prayer, Talk to God rather than yourself. 
at least it will give you extra prayer time. <laughs> when you believe that God is living with you, wherever you have room to live, you will have room to pray. Wherever you have room to live, you will have room to pray. You lack nothing that's needed to tell God what he wants, but you lack much that is needed to tell God what you want. That attitude to prayer, that it is prosaic, immediate, and accessible, is one aspect of her commitment to holiness for the person in the street. There's nothing here that is, in an exclusive sense, the province of the specialist, the hero or saint, let alone the monk. And I think it's rather a pity. Again, the title is The Little Monk. She uses the persona of the little monk, a sort of very average monk who's pushed into leadership in his community, as a kind of stalking horse for all Christians who are trying to grow and trying to take responsibility. And because she's interested in ordinary Christians growing and taking responsibility, then she's interested in what it is that is routinely available to the ordinary Christian, which is, of course, the nearness of God, the absolute, unconditional, unqualified nearness of God. If that's our starting point, well, all sorts of things become possible. But if God is that near, and that near to everyone, then, of course, we have to be very, very cautious about the judgments we instinctively pass on one another. Because God is near to the people we don't particularly want God to be near to, and God is as near to them as God is to us, which shows terrible taste on God's part, but there we are, that's the, <clears throat> that's the world we're in. Hence those very um, mordant bits of advice about spending time with the people who don't like you. But although she was herself um, a very committed social radical, she also wants to draw the sting of a kind of self-righteous and exclusivist radicalism. Jesus did not condemn the rich. He condemned those who assume that their wealth releases them from their responsibilities to the community, which is another of those things which I would quite happily see etched in granite all over the place. Christ never cursed anyone for being a banker, he did condemn those who judge others. <laughs> so, for all her radicalism, there is again that compassionate and pithy realism beneath it all. And the model that lies ahead of us, whether we're leaders or followers or whatever, is just to be part of something not a great saint and not a great sinner, one more member of the community called church. One more member of the community called church. She's painfully aware, and this is perhaps one of the toughest aspects of her writing, painfully aware of how what we think is central and productive in our faith and our witness can in some respects turn sour or negative. And here is one of the most searching things that she wrote about this. What you chose to advance your faith will turn out to be the very thing that you will hate about the faith. And she goes on. Experience has shown that these words are spoken, yelled, whispered, sobbed by women to their husbands after 10 years of marriage, husbands to their wives on their 10th wedding anniversary, doctors after 10 years of practice, activists after 10 years of protest, missionaries after 10 years of preaching, any believer at the end of 10 years of believing. Note that certain deviations were observed regarding the time frame. 
depending on the case, 10 years may be 7 or 13. However, everybody has the impression that it's 10 years. <laughs> what you chose to advance your faith will be the very thing that you will hate about the faith. So the things which we take up and follow out of a sincere, deep belief that they will help us grow take us to places we hadn't planned, where we may feel, after 10 years, sp speaking, yelling, whispering, or sobbing, resentful of the choice we've made. And this little axiom is not, I think, a way of saying, be careful of the choices you make, though it may be that. It's also saying, don't be too shocked or discountenanced by the 10-year itch, by the sense that you hate what you've chosen, because that's part of the ordinary rhythm of a Christian life. If you choose something prayerfully to deepen your faith, really with the goal of deepening your faith or your service, don't then be shocked or dismayed or disillusioned when it turns out to take you to places you really didn't want to go. And I think that's got something to do as well with the theme which has recurred so often in these reflections about faithfulness, about critical fidelity, or in plain English about sticking with it. She's somebody who in her own life and in her writing is a great advocate of sticking with it, doing the next thing to be done, not expecting dramatic success and not breaking your heart over dramatic failure and in a sense not expecting to be dramatic at all. So just a couple of other insights from here. If you want to be humble, don't belittle the greatness of others. And when you finally discover that you're just one of the little people, don't conclude that this makes you special. <laughs> don't reach a state of modesty as if you had just won the Tour de France. <laughs> to call oneself humble rarely means that one is humble. The truly humble know that they are but novices in matters of humility. A little section entitled Hygiene. It matters to know the difference between the stupor of our spirit and the condition of our body. If you lose your face, persevere. If you lose your head, stop. <laughs> if your heart goes to your head, too much has been going on. More than six billion people bear the burden of life. It helps to know you're no exception. There's an astringency about all this, which I certainly value. It shows no respect of humanity to let your brother behave like a fool. And keep in mind that just living with you may serve as enough penance to get someone into heaven. <laughs> <laughs> Here again, in terms of the care and responsibility we owe to one another, when you say to your brother, I'll take charge of your bundle, he'll be happy. When you say, I'll take charge of you, he won't. The responsibility we have for others is simply a responsibility of taking charge of the bundle, sharing a burden. And we're back here, aren't we, to the solidarity we've been looking at in the lives of Maria and Dorothy. Taking charge of you, that is saying, I am now responsible for shaping the life of my brother or sister in the community, saying that I must now dictate the terms of their discipleship. That's the mistake we so readily fall into. We can admonish, encourage, rebuke sometimes, applaud sometimes, but None of that will make any sense or have any credibility if it's not based on that fundamental sense of being alongside. 
not being an exception, being one of les gens de la rue, the people in the street. Of my three figures, Madeleine Delpoil has, in a sense, the least dramatic career. And that, I think, is something she'd be absolutely happy with. She stuck with it. She got on with being a director of social services. And there are some wonderful photographs of her online, which you might like to look up, which illustrate, I think, the, the prose of her discipleship. My favorite is a photograph taken, I think, just a couple of days before her death, um, which was from a completely unexpected stroke. And there she is, squatting down on her haunches in the street with her very bird-like head tilted on one side, a bit quizzically. She looks like Edith Piaf. And she's talking to a little girl playing with a humming top. A rather grubby little girl, also sitting in the street. And it's the attitude of simply squatting down to talk to this little girl with that very serious and attentive cocking of the head that, to me, exemplifies, brings visually in fleshly form all that advice about the difference between trying to be quiet and listening. There she is listening. There she is at the level of the people she's talking to. And when we move from the dramatic, costly solidarities of Maria Skoptsova as a martyr, Dorothy Day as an activist and protester, to that very simple picture of a 50-ish woman simply squatting down to listen to a little girl in the street, I suspect that's the level at which most of us would want to connect. When it comes to it, we can probably be Jean de la Rue, people in the street with Madeleine Delbrel, in those simple ways. We're not likely, as I said yesterday, to be arrested by the Gestapo. We're not even very likely to be fined in the courts of New York for failing to pay our taxes or being part of disorderly protests in the street, though you never know. We are quite likely to have a lot of people who need that kind of listening and that kind of active silence from us, active silence, which comes out of the awareness that there is nothing special about us except everything. Nothing special about being me rather than you, but the specialness of God's call and God's grace bestowed upon us so that we can do what we can do. No more, no less. Ordinary holiness, the ordinary awakening to God's faithfulness to us and our call to be faithful in turn. Looks to me as if some people have been looking up Madeleine Delpoil online <laughs> in the audience, and I'm very delighted. I hope people will share those images around as the afternoon wears on. But I, you, you see what I mean. <laughs> Wonderful picture. So I said I wouldn't talk too much this afternoon so that we had a reasonable amount of time for questions. But what I hope to do by just introducing you very, very briefly to Madeleine was to bring bring us down to earth, bring us to the local and the immediate and the achievable. And to remember that all that the great dramatic saints and martyrs have to say, the Marias and the Dorothys, is on a spectrum whose other end <clears throat> is this prosaic everyday holiness. This realism about ourselves and our failures, this willingness to be challenged, this wry and ironic awareness that we may be, in God's grace, the trial that will bring somebody else to heaven by their endurance of us, the realization that we are always prone to avoid those moments, those encounters and relationships where we're brought down to size. But what comes through this collection above all, and it's a word that's been pervasive in the two sessions that we've had already, what comes through is joy, actually. 
a joy which is certainly something very different from happiness and satisfaction in the usual sense, but is certainly, for Madeleine del Prel, an awareness of some deep homecoming in the love of God. So, one or two more things before I finish. As I say, I could just read you all of, all of these. To find God, it serves to know that he is everywhere. It also serves to know that he is not alone. That's a very remarkable saying, I think. God is everywhere, but God is not alone. In other words, where God is, he is with. Where God is, he is with. And when we encounter those who make demands on us, those who come for our support, our love, our help, or to our help, then, since God is everywhere, God is with those coming to us. And just as Mother Maria and Dorothy Day were able to recognize the beauty of Christ knocking on the door in the shape of the penniless refugee or the distressed alcoholic, so wherever we are, we are dealing with the not aloneness of God. God has always already arrived in the company of the people we meet. When you long for the desert, remember that God likes people. <laughs> Prayer does not mean being intelligent, it means being present. When you go to the ends of the earth, you will find traces of God. If you go to the depths of your soul, you will find God himself. But the God you find in the depths of yourself is that God who is not alone. And although Madeleine d'Albrel doesn't write very much about doctrine, she was, of course, a profoundly loyal Roman Catholic who went to the sacraments and assumed the doctrines of the creed. And that vision of a God who is everywhere but is not alone is, of course, a vision of the God revealed in Jesus Christ. The God who has decided never to be without Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the one who has decided never to be without the human race. So when we go to God, we go to that network of relations spreading out. The God who's decided to be God with us, wherever we are. I said right at the start that I hoped to illustrate in these three talks something of what it might mean to do theology by telling stories that required a theological grounding, stories that called out for theologizing, that told us what kind of God we were dealing with by showing us what kinds of human being we were dealing with. And Loveday, of course, underlined that again this morning. No collusion, I hasten to add. Underlined that this morning in talking about St. Mark's Gospel. The three lives that I've discussed are all of them lives which could be described in various ways as incarnationally significant. Lives of solidarity and alongsideness. And what's important about them all is also that they're not just a matter of our going to be with someone else. They're about others being with us and our going to them being inseparable from their coming to us and our giving therefore being inseparable from our receiving. And although this takes us into theological deep waters, it's perhaps important to bear in mind that when God comes among us in Jesus Christ. God in Jesus Christ takes from us, from the human race, the interlocking network of human relationship, human culture, human emotion, human understanding. God takes from us what it is to be human, receives from us what it is to be human. One reason why some of us 
of course, have some theological thoughts about the Virgin Mary as representing that dimension of God with us in Christ. If God had simply wanted to tell us he was with us in a general way and well disposed towards us and inclined to give us grace if we behaved ourselves, there would have been a number of other ways God could have done it. What God has actually done is to work through the interlocking interdependency of human life. To be someone who was nourished inside a woman's body, who sucked at a woman's breast, who learned human language from human parents, who learned and received humanity by being part of it, and who, as he received humanity, bestowed divine grace. And so we shouldn't be surprised that the community which emerges from the event of God with us in Jesus Christ is a community where we give and receive, a community where we learn to live out of the lives of each other, not on our own. And I take you back there to what Mother Maria has to say about a community where people don't queue up, get fed, and go away. Our faithfulness to one another is part of our faithfulness to God and our representation to the world of a God who is faith a God who is faithful. That God who is faithful requires us to be faithful in turn to the world God loves. And in all that, somehow, elusively, mysteriously, is holiness for people in the streets, like you and me. So can I suggest you just talk to each other again as we did before, and then we should have about 20 minutes for questions, all being well.